thank you bangladesh society of echocardiography for inviting me to talk on uh, transesophageal echocardiography uh, i am audible and my slides are seen well yes sir yeah thank you um a transesophageal echo gives you an extraordinary window by using this kind of a probe which is a fiber optic probe and it has got a handle with all the um, all the adjustments uh, uh, <coughs> sitting here with the electronic uh, with the electronic button and the wheels the transesophageal probe can also be flexed it can be anti flex retro flex right flex left flex what is more interesting is that there are few uh, there are few um, uh, simple movements like say torquing the probe to right brings the right sided structures torquing the probe to the left brings down the uh, left sided structures just advancing or withdrawing one can see the superior structures and inferior structures and not only that but by using a multiplanar rotation we can get extraordinary uh, planar views 2d planar views of the heart so the thing is we have got all the entire 360 degree view of the heart which we can utilize for a diagnosis and also guiding a lot of interventions we'll just uh, quickly run through the common views that we use this is the mid esophageal five chamber view this is the uh, long axis three chamber view a excellent uh, view for looking at the aortomitral intervalvular fibrosa and both the mitral and the aortic wall this is the upper esophageal 30 to 60 degree view where both the right superior and right inferior pulmonary veins can be seen with a carina in between this is the short axis view of the heart with the rv inflow and outflow um this is a, a 90 to 110 degree with a right right toward clockwise rotation and you can see the superior vena cava and inferior vena cava entering the right atrium this is the mid esophageal degree view to look at the left atrial appendage and this is an unusual view of 120 degrees where you can see both the left uh, left superior and left inferior pulmonary vein entering the left atrium with the carina in between then you have got a transgastric window to look at the short axis of the heart and also to look at the uh, lv long axis inflow and outflow and then you get marvelous views of the descending thoracic aorta and the arch of aorta uh, these are extraordinary views which can show you a lot of plaques and mobile thrombi in the arch of aorta and can find out the cause of a lot of cryptogenic strokes but how to learn the transesophageal echo the best way to learn the transesophageal echo is on the simulators now the simulators have gone to a very high level and this is one of the simulators now the uh, the simulation is now real life like and it gives you a lot of time to learn each and uh, or each of these views and there is a study to show that those cardiologists who are trained uh, or the cardiology fellows who are trained conventionally versus those who are trained on simulator at end of two months have much higher um higher uh, the proficiency uh, are more proficient to take most of the transesophageal views uh, this is our training lab uh, for the mannequin training you can see the two mannequins there and the cardiology fellows being trained and this is in mumbai i will I like all of you to visit us here at imast.org and uh, and uh, and there we get a 48 hours of rigorous training on the mannequin to learn all the transesophageal views now let us look at certain common uses of transesophageal echocardiography the mitral wall assessment now these kind of three dimensional uh, moving pictures you get while learning on the transesophageal echo to know your anatomic plane now these are the, uh, uh, the now these are the transesophageal planes which give you entire uh, the, the entire visualization of each and every scallop of aml and pml there is a zero degree view which uh, which shows your p2 and the a2 here but just pull it out and uh, when you open up the lvot you see the p1 and the a1 you go on a 60 degree view and you have bicommissural view which shows you p1 here p3 here and the a2 in the center and then you go to 90 degrees and from 90 degrees you just rotate medially and you see a good amount of p3 and a, a a part of a3 and then you go to 120 degrees and you see a2 and p2 
uh, the 3D, when you turn it on and uh, acquire a data set, it gives you an incremental value and you get these kind of pictures, which actually the surgeons love because that is how they think of the mitral wall. So this is the LA appendage. This is the uh, position of the uh, left ventricular outflow tract and AML. This is the lateral commission, medial commission. And you can see the PML is having a P2, which is flail. The ASD assessment is very routine part of transesophageal echo. And, uh, and, and these are the planes um, which you can utilize to see all the borders of A uh, uh, ASD for the suitability of device closure. So this is a zero degree view and you can see the mitral wall margin here and the uh, posterior superior atrial margin. And this is the uh, short axis view where you see the retroaortic margin and the posterior inferior atrial margin. And this is, a, uh, this is a place where actually at 70 to 80 degrees, you see the IVC side of the margin. And then you go to 110 and you see the superior vena cava side of the margin. And that tells you when it is more than 5 millimeter, you know that this is very, very suitable for a regular device closure. The encryptogenic strokes, when you are actually seeing the arch of aorta properly and ruled out that there are no, uh, no, no plaques there and the LA appendage and no clots, you can look at the saline bubble contrast with uh, Valsava. And you can see in this patient that the septum now, now bows towards the LA and the PFO literally opens up and there's a good amount of right to left shunt. And this is a very large right to left shunt with the Valsava maneuver. LA appendage looking for the clot the, uh, the one like this before the mitral interventions or looking uh, before the cardioversion and these are the pectinic muscles which may sometimes get misdiagnosed at the as the LA appendage clot. Now the uh, now these are the uh, routine ones and the mitra clip has made T as a center stage of your cath lab and the mitra clip is used before you think of a patient for mitra clip, you should be sure about the severity of MR and the mechanism of MR. And as you know, the Carpentier type 2, where either there is a A2 or P2 prolapse or fail, or the, um, or the secondary MRs, these are the targets for the mitra clip. And uh, a T is useful to look for the suitability for the mitra clip. And this is the P2 prolapse. And what you measure is the flail gap, which should be less than 10 millimeter. Look at the moving PML uh, size, it should be more than 10 millimeter. There should not be any calcium at the grasping site. And the uh, flail width you can measure on the 3D, which should be less than 15 millimeters. And for secondary mitral regurgitations, you look for the uh, flail, uh, you look for the depth of cooptation, which should be less than 11 millimeter, or look at the at the cooptation uh, of the leaflet, which should be at least two millimeters. Now these are the patients which are very ideal for the mitra clip. Now the transesophageal echo becomes almost a center piece for this intervention because everything is TE guided, as you can see that even the septal puncture is T guided because you have to be quite posterior and slightly superior and then you can uh, uh, then while you are positioning your steerable guide catheter or the clip delivery systems it is entirely under the uh, it is entirely under the T guidance that you uh, that you can tell the interventional cardiologist that he is whether he is away from the LA free wall, whether he is close to LA free wall, so that he can safely steer it towards the mitral wall. When it is very close to the mitral wall, you can also uh, you can also guide the interventionalist whether you are at the A two P two or you are deviated to A three P three. Uh, not only that, when the clip arms open, you can, on the 3D, you can see whether the clip arms are well oriented to the cooptation line or not. Without 3D imaging, it is virtually impossible to do mitra clip. Now, you can see that it is not well oriented. You will have to rotate it clockwise to make it perfectly perpendicular to the cooptation line. And once you enter the left ventricle, you can drop the grain and again see the orientation of your clip arms. And when the clips are closed, you can see whether the, both the leaflets are caught and whether the uh, mitral regurgitation has reduced. So TE has be become, uh, is indispensable, both the 3D TE and the 2D TE has become indispensable for most of the mitral wall procedures, especially the mitral clip or the trans mitral wall uh, or trans catheter mitral wall replacement. And immediately on the table, you can look whether the MR has reduced by looking at the behavior of the 
the pulmonary vein flow that before the clip you can see there is hardly any systolic forward flow the moment you have closed the clip there is a good amount of forward flow in systole telling you that the ala pressure has dramatically fallen uh, so so uh, so so my dear friends i will advise you to go to the journal of indian academy of echocardiography where we have published the indian academy of echocardiography guidelines for per performance of transesophageal echocardiography and this is the uh, the journal site and this is a free download and uh, we have put lot of efforts in putting this document which is 30 plus pages document describing everything about t and so also we have also published another document on in the journal of indian academy of echocardiography that is for the transesophageal echo in uh, cardio embolic uh, cardio cerebrovascular stroke uh, so uh, so i will uh, advise my dear colleagues to please go through both these uh, uh, both these uh, uh, articles they are freely available on the uh, site of journal of indian academy of echocardiography thank you thank you sir uh Dr. Nitin Berkle, for your uh, precious time and uh, excellent deliberation uh, on transesophageal echo. So uh, we have uh, one question from Dr. Osmani. Uh, he wants to know the re remark about 2D spectral uh, tracking in COVID era. Uh, I would like to ask this question to Dr. Rakesh, sir. Rakesh Gupta, sir. Uh, okay. Uh, can I go to Dr. Navin Nanda, sir? Can yeah, what, you what tell? Question, question again. Can you tell me the question. Uh, the question is uh, the question is two D spectral tracking in COVID era. Any role? I, I don't think there is any uh, very good literature on that so far, uh, as far as spectral tracking is concerned. But remember one thing about two D spectral tracking: it depends quite a bit on the window. If the window is poor, like many of the COVID patients have poor windows, uh, you may not get good results. So you know, so all, with all the hype that we have with spectral tracking echocardiography, you have to remember that one of the major problem is window problem. If the if you don't have a good endocardial definition, like we don't have many times, unless you do contrast echocardiography, then spectral tracking echocardiography results uh, may not really be very accurate. So in COVID patients, uh, that could be a problem in some other. Thank you, sir. Uh, as there is no more question, and we are um, uh, short of time, so just a little um, uh, concluding remarks uh, from uh, uh, Nanda, sir. Can you just conclude this session? Yeah, yeah, very good. Yeah, thank you very much. I think those are very, very good uh, topics. Uh, I think Dr. Parashar uh, mentioned very much about the left atrial strain. Uh, and that's that's something which is going to come in the future. Although it is not yet in the guidelines, it's not yet mainstream. Uh, but I think we all expect it to come very soon, as he mentioned. And uh, I think when it came to Dr. Burkule, he think he did a very great job in <clears throat> looking right from the beginning how to actually uh, get all the uh, images in the echocardiography, transesophageal echocardiography, and also he did a great job in telling how you actually do the mitral clip. Uh, how you actually insert the mitral clip, and Dr. Rakesh Gupta actually went a very good overview on strain imaging, and I think it's, it's a very important topic. Strain imaging, there's no question about that. But I think there are some limitations also, and also where you get the strain. Do you get the strain in the mid wall? Do you get it in the endocardium or just underneath the endocardium? All that will affect the strain volume. Now, see, there's one difference. See, when you are looking at LV function and you're looking at automatic. Uh, LV ejection fraction, you can look at it, but then you, can't, you, you also get an idea how the LV is actually moving. You have that mo notion at all. And supposing the, uh, the automatic comes up and says 20%, you see the ventricle is moving very well, you know something is wrong. But with the strain, you don't have that, uh, uh, you don't have that actually um, uh, advantage uh, because strain comes with a number. You really don't know how the base was moving towards the apex and it just comes with a number. And you don't know whether the number is correct or wrong. So that is the problem. That's one thing I would mention. And I think uh, uh, the doctor from uh, Mount Sinai Hospital also uh, showed very some very interesting uh, patients. Although there's some problem with the uh, with the slide. So the, overall, uh, it has really been a very great session.